tonight on 16 by 9. Providing investors with a solid return on their investment. A massive Ponzi scheme. None of it was true. The billionaire behind it. And what he did was take the money out of the bank and spend it on his lifestyle. And the Canadian bank that did business with him. Almost $3 billion went through the correspondent account. $3 billion through TD Bank. And then, a clear and very present danger. I pushed it with two hands, and my right hand went all the way through the window. How long have we known that wired glass has safety concerns attached to it? From the very beginning. Phased out in the U.S. Wired glass is not allowed in any hazardous location, in any occupancy in the United States. Still installed in Canada. You've referred to wired glass as a ticking time bomb. That's right. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9. Alan Stanford was among the wealthiest men in the U.S. He built a lavish lifestyle from banking and smooth talk. But his slick sales pitch turned out to be a lie. Stanford ran one of the biggest Ponzi schemes in American history. That is until his house of cards collapsed, costing investors billions. Tonight, Sean O'Shea has the story of a fraudulent empire built with the help of one of Canada's biggest banks. The spiel was awesome. You know, it was like books of fancy pictures and data and nice office with pictures of children on the walls. Um, it was very, very, very believable. And apparently after the fact, lots of people believed. Here, the possibilities are endless because potential has no boundaries. He built a marketing machine and a banking empire that spanned the globe. The Stanford organization today maintains in excess of $10 billion in deposits, assets under management, or advisement. That banking empire allowed Alan Stanford to become one of the richest men in the world. He even appeared on TV playing that role. Uh, is it fun being a billionaire? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, I have to say it is fun being a billionaire, but, a, but, it's a hard work, but it's hard work. <laughs> but as they say, behind every great fortune is a great crime. Uh, it was at night when it came on the evening news. Lewis had already gone to bed, and it said um, the SEC has shut the Stanford um, entity, whatever, down. Today, in the Southern District of Texas, an indictment charging R. Allen Stanford, chairman of the Houston-based Stanford Financial Group. And I went and woke Lewis up, and I said, baby, we may have lost our money with Stanford. That news meant that much of Kathleen and her husband Lewis's retirement savings, $240,000, were gone overnight. Money that was handed to this man. The moral to this story is if you're full of BS, it'll get you to the top, but it will never, never, never keep you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. None of it was true. None of it was true. His was a classic Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Hard-earned money went down the drain because of him. Southern Louisiana is a place where poverty had, for generations, been a way of life. Oh, it was very hard. My mom and dad were sharecroppers. Outside Baton Rouge, here near the Mississippi, people like Kathleen Meir grew up tough. It was a struggle, absolutely. Came home from school, put the work clothes on, went to the fields, picked up a boiled potato, a uh, boiled egg, whatever was mama had up for us, and she would work in the fields. Kathleen went to college and became a math teacher. But after 28 years of work, she started to think about retiring. We didn't have real high expectations about when we retire, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. We just wanted to retire comfortably and not rely on the government or our children. Kathleen and her husband didn't know much about investing, so she went with an investment advisor from their local bank. We did our jobs and we, we were gonna find somebody who could help us um, 
That's what a financial advisor does. That financial advisor suggested they put their money with Alan Stanford in Stanford Investments. For the past few years, the bank has enjoyed continued growth in all areas. We trusted him so much that we thought that was the best place to put it. You know, why not? Why, why not? I, I don't think there's any question but that there will be some criminal charges brought. Uh, why not became obvious in 2009 when the Stanford Bank collapsed. Kathleen and thousands of others lost their money. And a U.S. judge called Alan Stanford's operation one of the most egregious criminal frauds ever presented to a trial jury in federal court. His arrest meant the end of almost two decades of illegal financial activity. But to understand how Stanford got so big, you need to look here in Miami more than a decade earlier. Miami was his perfect playground, and it soon became the beating heart of his empire. Drug money built the Miami of the 1980s. Remember the movie Scarface? You remember the, the pop culture of what Miami represented with Miami Vice, the TV show. Michael Sala is an investigative reporter at the Miami Herald. You have the drug business and the drug trade that blew up here in the 1980s. At the time, it made big headlines. It's part of more than $22 million seized by U.S. Customs agents right here in Miami. The biggest single cash seizure in U.S. Customs history. All the cocaine coming into the country was 75% was coming through South Florida. In Miami today, two detectives were arrested on charges of shooting up the home of a drug dealer cooperating with federal authorities. So Miami became the epicenter, not only of the drug trade, but of the, the, where the drug money was coming into. Miami's cocaine cowboy era had ended by the 1990s. But that city still had lax rules and was an easy place for Alan Stanford to do business. Going into the 90s, Alan Stanford emerges. Stanford didn't like the American regulatory system. He didn't like regulators. He didn't want regulation. He fought it his entire banking career. A wash in money with very loose banking rules, corporations were flocking to the city, and they were cashing in. Miami was the perfect place where shady bankers could do business. What he wants to do is start selling certificates of deposit. He wants to start making investments and growing. Certificates of deposit were Stanford's bread and butter. They were like buying a savings bond, and customers thought they were insured. Stanford became a catchphrase for safe. Absolutely, absolutely wanting something safe. Never dreamed, never ever dreamed that this was not a safe investment because um, we had a good rapport with our broker. Stanford promised approximately 3% higher returns than similar investments sold by other banks, a profit that made Allen Stanford's certificates of deposit attractive to investors. Stanford said he could promise those higher returns because his bank was run smarter and more efficiently than other banks. The Eagle, proud symbol of Stanford Financial Group. Stanford spread the message and made slick corporate videos. And to bring that message to investors, Stanford used brokers. Our employees are the brightest and the most highly trained professionals in the financial services industry. They really negotiated hard and really wanted me. Charles Hazlitt was one of the brokers who sold investments for Stanford here in Miami. He tells us how Stanford recruited him to work for the company. What do you remember about that phone call with him? Big Texas draw, very friendly, uh, said kind of the things I wanted to hear, that they were looking to recruit, you know, some outstanding brokers, use a lot of buzzwords. He's bigger than life, you know, he uh, would say things like, you know, we want to hire someone that's as big as Texas, they can do all, you know, can produce like the size of Texas. The main reason Stanford can soar so high is our talented staff, of which I am very proud. Alan Stanford paid his brokers some of the best salaries in the city. And they're offering a good salary, right? Correct. Salary plus a, an incentive, an upfront bonus to move over. So how much was how much are we talking about? Uh, it was in the hundreds of thousands. So this was good. This was good money. Yes, it was. But with the fat paycheck also came pressure. One of Hazlitt's clients wanted more information about those super safe certificates of deposit. Hazlitt says he confronted his bosses and asked where the money was going. And they refused to, all they, all they told me was something like, it's 20% stocks, 15% bonds, 
uh, ten percent real. You know, but they didn't give me enough. I, you know, my, my client wanted more information. My client wanted to see the portfolio, basically, and they claimed it was proprietary. It was proprietary that this was some kind of secret sauce mix. Right. Some kind Which of banks thing. here don't aren't allowed to do that. Banks show their their balance sheet. Hazlitt kept asking questions. Hazlitt says that in the world of Alan Stanford, that made him a problem. I was ruffling too many feathers. I wasn't a team player. I wasn't. I wasn't a family. It was almost like mafia. I wasn't like a family member. You know, I wasn't. I was questioning the, questioning the uh, the Godfather, if you, if you will. In that regime, people didn't ask questions. Nobody asked questions. It got so bad that Hazlitt eventually quit. In the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you about the products, the services, and the personal philosophy that make us unique in the financial services industry. Stanford ended up coming after him for the bonus money he got when he joined. And Hazlitt says he ended up losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees and legal costs. In her small town, Kathleen was also feeling the pain caused by Stanford. Did y'all hear? Did y'all hear what happened to the Stanford stuff? Did y'all hear? And I didn't want to say a word. You know, I was so embarrassed. I could have, if I could have gone under the table, I would have. Next, building a case against the billionaire. Alan Stanford was one of the top two or three money laundering targets of the FBI and other law enforcement agencies in the Caribbean. So rolling. All right, ready? Hello, everyone. The first half of 2000. I don't like that. With charm, charisma, and a silver tongue. Hello, everyone. The first half of Robert Allen Stanford built a business. massive banking empire. It made him a billionaire. Can you hear me? And he treated his employees like family. I want all of you to enjoy yourself to the fullest this weekend. We have spared no expense, as you can see. The rules of the family were strict, and according to Hazlitt, employees were not supposed to ask too many questions about where the money was invested. People say, how in the world has this business of yours grown, Alan? I say, well, simply because we do things differently, many times we do them the way they used to do them 20 years ago. But at least one employee, Charles Hazlitt, did start asking questions. In fact, every time I brought up anything in meetings, everybody was looking at, looked at me very shocked. But do you think people didn't ask questions because the money kept flowing? Sure, a blind ignorance, right? I think they just they they, they didn't want to they didn't want to you know they didn't want to turn the rock over. To try and get Hazlitt on board, Stanford offered to send him to the bank's Caribbean headquarters in Antigua. I went to Antigua because Mr. Stanford kept saying, you know, I want you to you know, check out our, our, you know, our location there. You'll feel better about selling the CDs. And when I went there, that's really when I got nervous. His trip to Antigua did not put Hazlitt's concerns to rest. In fact, it was quite the opposite. It was all very gaudy, very, you know, very fancy. I didn't see any substance. I, interviewed, I talked to the, to the manager of the bank. He didn't seem to know a lot about banking in general. Antigua is home to Stanford International Bank. In the early 1990s, years before he set up in Miami, Antigua welcomed Alan Stanford and his money with open arms. He moved there, and soon, he and his businesses would dominate the island. In the early 1990s, Antigua had very lax, if not non-existent, uh, money laundering rules. So you could operate in that venue without fear of being prosecuted locally. Charles Hazlitt was not the first person to start asking hard questions about Alan Stanford. Years earlier, this man was doing his own investigating. He suspected Stanford was a major money launderer. His name is Ross Gaffney, and he ran the White Collar Crime Squad in the Miami FBI. I would say that at the time, Alan Stanford was one of the top two or three money laundering targets of the FBI and other law enforcement agencies in the Caribbean. We set up a sting operation based on actionable intelligence. We recorded conversations with Stanford in which he very candidly laid out what he charged to launder money, who he paid off. Uh, he was very boastful of, you know, that he was a major money laundering uh, bank 
Ross says the drug kingpins were good at hiding their tracks. Also, the Miami FBI couldn't conduct extensive and long-term covert ops in Antigua. Tough U.S. rules prevented them from doing so. So despite some undercover work, the FBI could not make the case against Stanford stick. Mr. Prime Minister, members of government. As Stanford's influence on the island grew, rumors of money laundering would persist for years. He paid over $200,000 to the lead top regulator in Antigua to look the other way and allow him to essentially keep his operation flourishing, keep it from being disclosed. In 1999, the U.S. government was so fed up with Antigua and Stanford's relationship, the U.S. Department of the Treasury issued a rare warning, only the second of its kind in history. The American government said that Antigua's anti-money laundering laws were weakened because the regulator there includes representatives of the very institutions the authority is supposed to regulate. What happened was he basically took over the regulation of his own bank in Antigua. He was able to put himself on the board of the regulators that oversaw his bank. Antigua had become a major money laundering nation, and Stanford, who was now the most powerful man on the island, had become a problem. And our U.S. government reacted by issuing this extraordinary warning and, and spelling it out, that, and they didn't mention him by name. One State Department wire obtained by 16 by 9 said that the Antiguan government has effectively ceded oversight of its offshore sector to an offshore banker and his minions. None of this stopped Stanford or even slowed him down. Stanford Group Company, brokerage firm with branch offices in Miami, Denver, Baton Rouge, Dallas-Fort Worth, and Bonita Springs. Staying one step ahead of the law, Alan Stanford just kept growing his business, expanding in the U.S. and elsewhere. As you have seen, the Stanford Financial Group offers a full array of financial services in many markets throughout the globe. Alan Stanford's big focus in the U.S. became those certificates of deposit, CDs. He uh, just looted the banks. Lincoln Kaler is a Toronto lawyer who's looked into Stanford's operation. He says many of those Stanford certificates of deposit were worthless to many people. So what he did was he went out and sold certificates of deposit to investors. They bought them. He would pay them uh, interest. And he paid the interest from the new investors. Banks are supposed to take certificate of deposit money and put it in safe investments, getting a small return, which they then use to pay their investors. Providing investors with a solid return on their investment. Stanford didn't do that. He used new investors' money to pay the interest to the old investors. In other words, a classic Ponzi scheme. So a classic, no real underlying investment that's making money. And what he did in the meantime was take money out of the bank and spend it on his lifestyle. I just knew something wasn't right. They couldn't generate a return on the portfolio to pay those kind of CD rates without something being wrong. You know? Something was wrong. And the fraud was much bigger than he ever realized. The Stanford International Bank Ponzi scheme is the second biggest in the world ever. The core capital loss to the investors is $5.5 billion. To keep the scheme alive, those billions needed to move from Stanford's clients in the U.S. and South America to accounts controlled by Alan Stanford. To do that, he needed a big bank, one that would give his operation credibility. For that, Stanford used the same bank 12 million customers across Canada use. But in terms of scope, the TD, TD was, the was by far the biggest, right? The majority of the money went through TD. Yeah. Next. How a Canadian bank backed a billionaire fraudster. The very fact that they are taking him on as a correspondent bank, they're vouching for his legitimacy. So around 1990, he opened a correspondent banking relationship with Toronto Dominion Bank here in Toronto. Alan Stanford started his 18-year relationship with the Toronto Dominion Bank while he was a small banker in Antigua. Rumble beginnings, we have created a world-class financial services organization with global reach. That relationship continued as Stanford's business exploded. 
Lincoln Kaler is a Canadian lawyer whose firm is suing TD for facilitating Stanford's Ponzi scheme. Without external banks that have access to the U.S. market, the U.S. financial system, he couldn't have done what he did. Stanford needed to hook up with a bank so he could easily transfer his billions to accounts he controlled. What he really wanted, according to Link Kaler, was a North American bank so he could do business in U.S. dollars. So Stanford needed banks that would play ball. Based on our investigation, a number of U.S. banks either refused to bank Alan Stanford or quickly stopped banking him. But TD said yes to Alan Stanford and banked him for nearly two decades. And according to Ross Gaffney, for Stanford, having that correspondent banking relationship with TD was a big advantage. The very fact that they are taking him on as a correspondent bank, they're vouching for his legitimacy with other financial institutions. Gaffney says that legitimacy that TD provided Stanford was important as Stanford grew his business. He could go back and say to the people in the Caribbean or to people in South America, my relationship was with you know, one of the top five banks in Canada. Canada was also known internationally as a safe harbor, a place where banking was more conservative and less risky. For TD, being a Canadian correspondent bank and moving money for another bank also came with responsibilities. TD officials were required to do their homework. TD bankers took due diligence trips and met with Stanford's people. Their job was to make sure his operation was above board. While Stanford was looting his own bank, Kaler says TD was doing next to nothing. Based on what we've found out so far, the content of the presentations that we found given to the TD bankers were very superficial. We know other bankers who asked the tough questions didn't get the answers and stopped banking them. According to internal documents obtained by 16 by 9, there was also socializing done between TD and Stanford officials. One TD official participated in PGA Golf Pro-Am tournaments sponsored by Stanford. And Stanford staff and TD bankers ate at a fancy restaurant together. According to Link Kaler, while TD had relationships with hundreds of banks, including some of the biggest in the U.S. and worldwide, amazingly, Stanford overtook all of them, becoming TD's biggest correspondent banking customer. The um, correspondent banking relationship, as we understand from our investigation, became their biggest correspondent banking relationship, which seems odd given that it's a relatively small bank in Antigua. We're not just talking about a little bit of money here. How much money was flowing through TD Bank and Stanford in the last year? In the approximate last 12 months, almost $3 billion went through the correspondent account. $3 billion through TD Bank. Correct. In one year. Correct. And Kaler says all that Stanford money going through Toronto Dominion Bank meant more corporate banking revenues for TD. According to TD's annual reports, those revenues increased by $71 million from 2005 to 2007. A 22% increase in revenue that Kaler says was due in part to an increase in correspondent banking with Stanford. For Stanford, all that cash coming in via the Toronto Dominion Bank meant he could have a very big lifestyle, according to Kaler. Well, he's the biggest guy on the island. Uh, he's got the, the at least four private jets that he used to fly all around the world, uh, at least two huge uh, yachts. Uh, he's got homes all over the world, and he's taking extravagant holidays. He's got the helicopter that says Stanford on it. So, I, yeah, he's living large. He's the uh, king of the hill. For that king of the hill, reputation was everything, a reputation that he carefully managed as the fraud grew bigger. We need many more investors with this type of long-term commitment, willing to work, and having a government, many times just as important, if not more, willing to work with the investor. Stanford was the legitimate banker. He also played the role of great philanthropist. Stanford companies and people around the world support more than 100 non-profit organizations. And hatred of sport. One of the monumental undertakings in the history of world cricket, the Stanford 2020 tournament. But in 2009, the game was up for Robert Allen Stanford, and his arrest made headlines. He is being charged by the Securities and Exchange Commission with committing fraud. 
United States federal officials moved in and shut down his offices in February of that year. The Securities and Exchange Commission alleges Stanford is running a fraud scheme. They also seized his passport. Alan Stanford was charged with 14 counts. At the time, he denied those allegations to an ABC News reporter. I will die and go to hell if it's a Ponzi scheme. It's no Ponzi scheme. The other allegation is that you were involved with the Mexican drug cartels. Oh, bull If you say it to my face again, I will punch you in the mouth. You're going to punch me in no, the mouth? No, I'm not going to punch you in the mouth. But I'm just saying that is, that is absolutely an, an absolutely ludicrous thing to say. Despite denials, in 2012, Alan Stanford would be convicted on 13 of 14 counts, which included fraud and obstruction of a Securities and Exchange Commission investigation. A conviction that led to an astonishing 110-year sentence in a U.S. federal penitentiary. The appeals court would later say that Stanford sat atop a massive Ponzi scheme and that by 2008, Stanford built approximately $1 million per day from investors to finance his personal endeavors. I'm proud of everything I've done. I've never involved myself in anything wrong or illegal or, or unethical. We wanted to know why, for almost two decades, the Toronto Dominion Bank did business with Alan Stanford, one of the biggest fraudsters in North American history. We asked TD for an on-camera interview, and they told us it is TD policy to not comment on matters before the courts. In the past, TD said they had no knowledge of Stanford's fraudulent or illegal activities, and they were neither reckless or willfully blind as Stanford's correspondent bankers. As for Alan Stanford, he wrote to us saying, without exception, everyone in the media has lied to him and swallowed hook, line and sinker the government propaganda. With rumors of money laundering, red flags about Antigua, the payment of bribes, and persistent questions about Stanford's credibility, Kaler says TD should have been a lot more careful. There's a level of due diligence they're supposed to go, keep doing over the time of the relationship. And it's our client's position that they fell below that standard when they dealt with Alan Stanford and his bank. Kathleen Meir has moved on from losing so much of her retirement. She's still angry at Alan Stanford and his lies. Shame on you, that's what I tell him. Shame on you, poor people, you know, who trusted, uh, shame. Shame, shame for the lives you've ruined. The following program includes graphic images intended for adult audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. It's everywhere you go, and yet you've probably never noticed it. It's called wired glass, glass with wire mesh in it. It looks strong and has been used for decades in places we consider the safest, including hospitals and schools. But as 16 by 9 discovered, wired glass can be an accident waiting to happen, causing injuries that take people to the brink of death. Risks that have been flagged for years. I was in Kingston, at a hotel in Kingston. It was uh, second floor, up one flight of stairs, and it was uh, the door in the hallway. There was no push bar on the door, there was no handle, it was just glass window. And it actually had a push sign on the window. 22 years old and without knowing it, Devin King was standing at the precipice of a life-changing moment. I pushed it with two hands and my right hand went all the way through the window. The wired glass window in the hotel door gave way. The hotel claims that's because Devin punched it. Yes, I was at a wedding and I was drinking, but I wasn't running. I didn't push the door any different than I did 10 times that day. Since it was wired glass, normally the window would shatter and break away, but the wire held the glass in place. 
a cut my artery, cut two of my nerves, and cut to the bone through my bicep, cut to the bone through my tricep, cut to the bone through my rear deltoid. It was, you know, flesh hanging off the bone. With his artery severed, time became critical. It was just like, like water coming out of a faucet, the blood pouring out of me. I yelled for my brother because he was in uh, my hotel room and um, I passed out from loss of blood and fell down the stairs. The paramedics came and uh, they couldn't get a tourniquet around my arm so they uh, put me in the ambulance and sat on me the whole way to the hospital because there was no way to stop the bleeding. Devin says he lost seven bags worth of blood and was rushed into a nine and a half hour surgery. My heart stopped three times at the table, so it could have easily stayed that way. I could have easily died there. It would take roughly 250 stitches to patch together his arm. What could not be reassembled was Devin's life as he knew it before. He never regained full use of his hand. His plans of being a pilot in the military were dashed. Those dreams ended in that fateful hotel stairway. I think it took me a long time to really comprehend how much this was gonna affect my life. So I was released from the military, had to find a new career, had to find new ways to do everything that I do because I wasn't able to use my arm for a long time. So it, it changed every facet of my life. So the act of putting that mesh of glass inside and getting that... Engineering professor Doug Perovic says wired glass was designed to protect against fire and does. But the glass has one serious flaw it doesn't withstand any significant impact. How long have we known that wired glass has safety concerns attached to it? From the very beginning. And we still installed it in public buildings? That's correct. When it was first introduced as a commercial product, it was tested for impact, strength and resistance, and it failed those tests. But because there was no other fire-rated product available, they gave it an exemption. Hold on, because there was nothing better, they sent it through? It was supposed to be only for a year or two. That exemption was made in the US, but in Canada, we'd already been using wired glass for years and continued to do so. Today, you'll find it almost everywhere, in hospitals, hockey rinks, and schools. The point that wired glass is half the strength of the regular glass that you start with. So by putting that in there, even though it looks all strong and great, you're reducing the strength of that original glass by about a factor of two. And Doug showed us why, using a high-powered microscope and a sample of wired glass. So the wire is actually in making the glass easier to fracture. And so when you put a bending force, let's say you're pushing on a panel of glass, cracks then start to form around the wire locations that wouldn't if the wires were not there. Those dark edges you see around the wire are the points of weakness that leave it vulnerable to breaks. You can visually see the gap that exists between there. It, uh, it was never bonded uh, fully. This is a telltale sign. Of a area of, of uh, stress concentration, yes. Ironically, this type of glass is referred to as safety glass. But Greg Abel of Portland, Oregon begs to differ. Do you consider wired glass a safety product? Oh, absolutely not. For 15 years, he's been pushing for stronger glass standards, ever since his own son was injured by it in a university gym. The further I got into it, the, the more I realized that people had been being lied to by the impact qualities, and that all of these people that had been told that it was an isolated incident, that was not the case at all. There were literally thousands of young people being injured annually. It became Greg's obsession to have the building codes changed. But the wired glass industry, which developed into a profitable business, wasn't about to go down. 
So the risk to the industry was in the millions of dollars. Correct. This fight became about money. It was always about money. So safety was pitted against money? Of course, without question. Who was winning? The wire glass manufacturers. It was our children that were losing. But in 2006, Greg was triumphant. The U.S. updated its standards. Wired glass now had to meet a new, higher impact test. And traditional wired glass wasn't strong enough. Wired glass is not allowed in any hazardous location, in any occupancy in the United States. It was a voluntary standard, but in the years to come, it was adopted across most states. That meant any new construction would be forbidden from using wired glass if it didn't meet the standard. In Canada, nothing changed. The longer they are able to delay the banning of wired glass in, in Canada, it, it amounts to millions and millions of dollars. And so this seemingly innocuous glass continues to be installed and continues to injure and maim. Today, is there a better alternative? There are better alternatives, and they've been available for 10, 15 years. And so why aren't we using those as the standard instead of wired glass? The main reason is because it's not stipulated, it's not uh, enforced by the building codes. The Canadian National Building Code is what engineer Doug Perovic is referring to. It uses the Canadian General Standards Board guideline for wired glass, a standard that hasn't been updated since 1990. We wanted to know why and who's responsible for changing it. Next, dangerous wired glass still installed in Canadian schools. It's shocking that these schools and the school boards know of the danger, they have to know of it, and they're still replacing or putting up wired glass. The following program includes graphic images intended for adult audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Nineteen eighty three, and the lead story on Channel Seven Chicago, Wired Glass. Our top story on Eyewitness News at five, an exclusive report by our Target Seven team on a type of glass that is supposed to be safe, but apparently causes injuries and a great deal of money to replace. And what's the reality? The reality is it's less strong than ordinary glass and more likely to cause injury than ordinary glass. Even 30 years ago, experts were aware of the dangers of wired glass. The experts should get this point across to the people that make the codes and the laws so that this can be corrected. And yet it wasn't until the 2000s that wired glass started to be phased out in the U.S. But in Canada today, the building codes still allow it. People are still being hurt. Even the manufacturers know it doesn't stand up to impact. Right on the box in bold letters, a caution. The wired glass should not be used where human impact is possible. Places like educational facilities. The Canadian Glass Association issued a similar warning and even supports updating the building codes. And yet, this is one of the places you'll find it most often in Canada. And these are the unfortunate stories that can result. Tyler Dickey of Amherst, Nova Scotia. It was like the last month of school in grade 11. And Jaden Highland of Toronto. Monday, December 2nd, 2013. It was lunchtime, so I actually walked through the cafeteria. And uh, it was a long hallway, and at the end of the hallway, there's uh, two sets of doors. Me and my buddy, we were horsing around, and he just he started running away from me, and I was chasing him. It has no uh, push bar on it. It's just two uh, plain glass of the window at the top, and then the glass at the bottom. It's metal, and then the windows on the door are the wired glass windows. Put both hands, palms up, on the glass part of the door. I push the window, and there's just no resistance, just right through. Like Superman threw it. I got cuts all up both arms. I looked down and I seen the blood and 
like it was like a flap of skin. The glass just completely just sliced up my face and my arms. I touched my face and my hand, like my finger completely went into my cheek. I had a friend who actually said it looked like I had a two liter bottle of juice and just dumped it. I was walking down the hall dumping juice, so that's what he thought it was, was actually happening. Like it was a flap, like I could lift it up and you could see my skull. My shirt, my clothes, everything it was just bloody. It felt like I was in a horror movie. Like, yeah, it doesn't look good. Like, there's, yeah, a very good chance he's not going to make it for sure. You've referred to wired glass as a ticking time bomb. That's right. Michael Smitchuk is an injury lawyer representing Tyler and Jaden. It's just a matter of time before children being children will impact the glass and, and be severely injured like they have already been. Both Tyler and Jaden are now suing their school boards for the injuries they suffered because of wired glass. But in court documents, their school boards have blamed them for their injuries, saying they were acting recklessly. What are schools and school boards saying to your clients when they're injured? Usually they'll say, you had something to do with it. So it's quite alarming that the school boards almost suggest that the student is to blame when they know full well how dangerous this is. Most school boards in Ontario have been warned by their insurer since 2001 that wired glass can cause horrible injuries. That Ontario insurer has dealt with 114 injury claims related to wired glass in the past 14 years alone, costing nearly $6 million. How is it that that warning can fall on deaf ears? It's shocking. It's shocking that uh, these schools and the school boards know of the danger, they have to know of it, and they're still replacing or putting up wired glass. But Jaden's school board has signaled a change. The largest in Canada, the Toronto District School Board. Its spokesperson, Ryan Bird. Our new builds will be using some sort of alternate safety glass that are now on the market. The move will only apply to new construction. Wired glass already installed won't be replaced. If wired glass is deemed dangerous, isn't it unsafe to keep it in your current schools? It's just not possible financially to replace every single wired glass window in the Toronto District School Board, given the countless millions of dollars that it would cost. But a student so, would say to you, how can you put a price on my safety? Obviously, my heart goes out to them, and I, I, I hope that they're okay. But we're having to try to look after as many students as possible. The Toronto School Board points out it has always been in compliance with the building and fire codes, even while using wired glass. It's just the wired glass standard hasn't been updated in 25 years. So why has it taken so long to update a glass standard while people are being injured? We wanted to ask the Canadian General Standards Board that very question. It sets the guidelines for wired glass use in Canada guidelines that the provinces then adopt and make mandatory. But after two months of correspondence and asking for an interview, they declined, stating in an email that a committee is reviewing the standards for wired glass, expected to be complete in mid to late 2016. It's a significant move, but it won't do anything to change all of the wired glass that's already installed. Eight years after Tyler Dickey's accident, he still has panic attacks. Just uh, automatically think, yeah, I'm dying. Like, my heart's going to explode. While Jaden Highland says he's accepted what's happened to him, just not why. Having to look in the mirror every day and just seeing some huge scars on your face to bother anybody. A reminder of that terrible day. Yeah. And so while glass standards in Canada are being reviewed, they have a message. Glass is, is not something to play around with, so they're just, yeah, playing with people's lives. What do you think the standards should say? It just, just should be changed. It shouldn't be in anywhere with a whole bunch of kids. I would leave them with something to think about. Does it take for someone to die before you change it? And that is our broadcast for tonight. A reminder, you can always connect with us on Facebook and Twitter or at globalnews.ca slash 16 by 9. I'm Carolyn Jarvis. From all of us here at 16 by 9, thanks for watching.